Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History with Haiku and our topic for today, U-boat batteries. Now during World War II, U-boats used lead-acid batteries to supply power while underwater. The batteries supplied power to the electric motors, which drove the boat, as well as providing power for interior electrical systems, the galley and life support systems. We have a few definitions uh, before we get into the briefing. I'm not going to read through these, but as always, feel free to pause the briefing if you want to study the slide and read these definitions. Uh, but basically, we're focused with, excuse me, we're focused on uh, amps, amp hours, voltage, watts, and watt hour. Although this is not a physics or electrical engineering brief, don't worry about that. But I at least have to be able to throw these terms out there. So I'm assuming anybody watching this channel probably has a basic understanding of batteries, right? Um, so we're not going to get into super fundamental stuff, but um, we will talk about series versus parallel. Batteries connected in series will have their voltages added together. Batteries connected in parallel will have their capacities, which is measured in amp hours, added together. Now the total available energy measured in watt hours in both configurations is the same. So that's kind of like our hard limit. The lead acid battery was the battery of choice for U-boats. Um, and actually, it was the choice for submarines of any nation. The lead acid battery was invented in 1859 by French physicist Gaston Plant. Sorry if I've slaughtered that. Um, and this was the first type of rechargeable battery ever created. It has a relatively low energy density, um, but it is able to supply high surge currents, and it has a large power to weight ratio and a low cost. A U-boat used two batteries. One would be forward, one would be aft. <clears throat> and in this illustration, you'll notice the battery locations are highlighted in yellow. And each of these batteries would provide half of the power for the boat. <clears throat> The batteries could be used individually, or they could be connected in series or parallel to meet power needs. So let's talk about batteries and cells. <clears throat> a battery consists of a number of cells connected in series that contribute to the overall battery voltage. A cell is a sealed unit that consists of a positive and negative lead plate submerged in a sulfuric acid and distilled water bath. Lead acid battery chemistry dictates 2.1 volts for a given cell. And lead acid batteries, the design of the cell, limits dive angles in a boat to about 35 degrees. Uh, if you would exceed that, 35, that 30 to 35 degrees, you would ask, actually risk spilling some of your electrolyte, which is that sulfuric and um, water bath. So let's talk about something that we can relate to, uh, and that would be a car battery. An automotive lead acid battery consists of six cells inside the battery housing, each cell contributing 2.1 volts towards the battery's overall 12.6 volts. Now, a U-boat lead acid battery cell also contributes 2.1 volts towards the battery's overall total vo voltage. This is a limitation of the lead acid battery chemistry. One battery type used in the Type 7C boat was the 33-mile 800W, consisting of 62 individual cells providing 130 volts. Two batteries used in the boat to provide either 110 or 220 volts as needed. And this table shows you um, how they would arrange the batteries depending on what they wanted to do speed-wise. And if you'll notice here, uh, the first three drive settings, dead slow, slow, and half speed, at those, at those slow speeds, we have the batteries connected in parallel. So it's providing lower voltage, but it's giving us much more amp hours. And this is what you would want if you were underwater and needed to be underwater for an extended period of time. You would want to move slow, and you would want to have lots of amp hours to support you while you were underwater. Um, as we have to speed up the boat, once we get to half, sp once we get to half speed times two, would be both engines running to provide that half speed. 
And it's at that point <clears throat> where we need more voltage to drive the motors so that we can attain these higher speeds, which we can do, although our amp hours go down dramatically, which means we can't sustain those high speeds for a long period of time. And this is another, another table that just kind of illustrates um, what I was just talking about in the previous slide. If you'll notice that first line, our discharge current, if it's at 3,630, that's going to give us about an hour and a half of battery time. That will give a, that will yield us 5,450 amp hours. Go to the bottom of that figure, and you'll see the discharge current, 196 amps, which we can sustain for 50 hours, and that provides us with 9,800 amp hours during that period of time. So that first line would rep represent probably traveling at flank speed. Uh, that bottom value would probably represent traveling at slow speed. So let's take a look a little bit at the lead acid battery chemistry itself. <clears throat> on the left hand side we have the normal state where on the left our positive terminal is a lead dioxide plate. On the right the negative terminal that is a lead plate and in between the two plates we have this uh, electrolyte consisting of sulfuric acid and pure water. If we look at the middle illustration number two discharge as we as we close the circuit and draw power from the cell we are moving electrons from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. While we're moving electrons the sulfuric acid in water, they're disassociated into their ions. We're losing oxides from the positive plate. And when we have comp when we have discharged our battery, what we are left with is lead sulfate on the positive plate and lead sulfate on the negative plate with water in between. So during the process of using the battery, we've basically consumed the sulfuric acid so that we can actually do the reaction and, and get the power that we need. To charge the batteries, we would go through this opposite process. We would impress a current the other way um, through the battery in order to drive off the sulfates, um, get everything back into solution, and then we're able to get the plates back to their original state. So when a battery is being charged, Hydrogen, hydrogen gas can be liberated. The production of hydrogen gas is strictly controlled through a staged charging process. Each cell in a battery has a vent to release hydrogen gas, which is collected through piping and vented to atmosphere. The Type 33 Mol 800W battery, uh, charging begins with 1650 amps at the first stage. That is stepped down to an intermediate amperage and then it's gradually reduced to 415 amps, the third and final charging phase. In special cases, fast charging is done by doubling the first charging phase, uh, and the charging time is shortened by about one third. Extensively drawing down the voltage in a battery, in our case for lead acid, um, being greater than 80%, and poorly controlled charging risks damaging the battery through the incomplete conversion of lead sulfite also called sulfation. Sulfation is the result of lead sulfate not being fully converted during the charging process. This leads lead sulfate crystals on the lead plates, which gradually builds up over time and ruins the battery. And in real life, typical U-boat batteries lasted about 15 to 21 months. So much shorter than your car battery. But these batteries are being used um, a lot differently than your car battery. Now battery maintenance. Maintenance involved thoroughly cleaning the batteries uh, from all metallic form bodies, oil and seawater. Uh, the crew would be checking the batteries uh, monthly and these checks would include acid density, acid level, temperature and voltage. They could make, uh, they did have some, dis they did have at least one distillation plant on the U-boat and that would provide them with enough pure water on a regular basis that they could actually top off the batteries when it was required. Uh, also you would 
on a regular basis, you would examine bilge water under the batteries and check it for the presence of acid. Now, moving on to battery hazards. The two main hazards with lead acid batteries in submarines are the formation of hydrogen gas during the battery charging process and the formation of chlorine gas when seawater contacts batteries in the interior of battery cells. Hydrogen gas. At standard conditions, hydrogen is a gas having the formula H2. Uh, it's lighter than air. It is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic, but also highly combustible and explosive. Hydrogen gas can be released inside a boat if the hydrogen gas collection and venting system is compromised, which could happen as a result of, say, depth charging. The presence of hydrogen can be detected through the use of uh, Traeger sampling tubes. And if you look at uh, briefing number three, U-Boat Underwater Endurance, there's a section there where I discuss the use and application of the Traeger tubes. So a U-boat, they would have the ability, if they were concerned that hydrogen might be building up in the boat, they could actually test for it. Chlorine gas. At standard conditions, chlorine is a gas having the formula Cl. It's heavier than air. It is, it is a yellow-green gas with the smell of bleach and a very strong oxidant. Chlorine gas can be generated by electrolysis if seawater inside the boat rises high enough to submerge battery cell terminals. If seawater gets into the cells of the battery, the lead dioxide in the electrodes can convert the chloride ion to chlorine gas. And um, this is, this is ac the actual chemical reaction. There's actually a intermediate step where um, there is the formation of hydrofluoric acid and it's as a result of that acid the chlorides are able to be converted in the second step to make chlorine gas um, so really the lead uh, the lead dioxide is a stronger oxidant than the sulfuric acid and that's what drives the chemical re reaction to produce the chlorine gas not the sulfuric acid itself which is what a lot of people understand And then a couple case studies. This is the uh, USS E2, SS25, uh, and also formerly known as Sturgeon uh, while it was being built. So it was commissioned on 14 February 1912. In Jan on January 15, 1916, the boat suffered a hydrogen gas explosion, which killed four and injured seven. At that time, the boat was actually testing batteries that used a nickel-potassium chemistry. This is interesting. This is a battery that was actually developed by Thomas Edison. He's still alive at this time. And he's uh, serving on, I think, the Naval Advisory Board. <clears throat> but it had been discussed, like, you know, the problems with lead-acid batteries and the, and the potential formation of chlorine gas. This battery solved that problem. Uh, in addition to eliminating the formation of or potential formation of chlorine gas, the design of the, bat of the battery and cells, uh, it, it would allow deeper uh, dive angles for boats where they, could, where they weren't limited to like 30 or 35 degrees. They could actually dive at like up to 60 degrees, which would be insane. But um, the batteries were also, this battery was also lighter and it had a faster recharge time. However, it was three times the cost of a lead acid battery and it didn't solve the problem of hydrogen gas generation. So ultimately, it was never adopted by the U.S. Navy. USS Sailfish, uh, SS-192, also formerly known as Squalus. It was commissioned on 1 March 1939. It sank by flooding on 23 May 1939 during a test dive. 26 crew were killed by drowning uh, in flooded compartments. 33 crew suffered effects from chlorine gas inhalation over approximately 40 hours while awaiting rescue. And this was the first test of the McCann rescue chamber, which we will not talk about today, but we will talk about that at some time in the future. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email 
I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Thanks to USNI for doing the job they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, peace out.